Hi, this is Shane Mueller and I'm making this video to describe some projects a few of my students did for a class I taught in modeling human cognition. And for the final um, projects for this class, uh, three graduate students worked on projects to see how they could bring some of the models to epidemic modeling and epidemic simulation. And um, they each have a project um, that's linked on this website and with videos describing them. And um, the three projects are here. I'm going to be talking about the base model that they're all based on and introducing you to the uh, topic a little bit. So um, this is the web page describing and linking to the different models with the code. And if you want to view on GitHub, you get to this page. Um, if you're not familiar with GitHub, the easiest way to download this is through hit clone or download. This will make a zip file that downloads this for you. <clears throat> and then you can open these things up in um, in R Studio or R, which is where, um, which is uh, the modeling platform they're created for. So the basic notion is that we wanted to create agent-based models to, to model the epidemic, and rather than what um, are currently being used which are um, differential equation models mostly um, that may not be able to explore all the same things you can explore with an agent-based model. And um, so for example, you can explore the form of different networks. So here's a network of different connections and how the disease spreads. And here's one with a different kind of connection, which is another student model, which models um, work and school and <coughs> geography and family networks separately. Um, and we also have one that is describes the um, has the model re representing a geographic model in the shape of the layout of Michigan. So we can see how the agents um, are spread mostly in southeast Michigan, and um, we are up here, and we want to know if if this can help us understand disease spread in um, different types of networks like this. <clears throat> so um, assuming that you download this and um, you can download the RMD file and it will and open it up in RStudio. So we're going to be looking through the one created by Epidemic Model Base, which is just a simple model. I'll be talking through it, but not, not um, in our studio. If you want to run this, um, it should run without any other files, but you need a few libraries that it uses. Here's a set of the libraries, and, and if you run this for the first time, it might ask you for to install these. Otherwise, you can go to packages and try to install each of these packages in order to get it to run. Once done, I've um, under I've created a web page under this option here. And I'm just going to be showing you the web page. For, for this particular um, file, um, it took a few minutes to generate this web page. But, but for large simulations, it's going to take a long time. Um, it might take five minutes to run the simulation if it gets large enough. So just recognize that the simulation is actually simulating agents interacting over time. And the larger the model you have, the longer it's going to take. Um, so <clears throat> this is just describing the basic model, and the basic model has two parts. It has the agent and how it progresses through the disease, and then it has the social part of how agents interact with one another. So first we <clears throat> wanted to develop a simple agent that could be unexposed, but then when it gets its, the disease, follows a pathway through the disease whose parameters we can set to mimic what we think we know about COVID-19. So we set up these specific um, states a person or an agent could be in, and <clears throat> a time scale for each state, and a transitions between each state. And that's what the first part of this shows. I'm doing to first it's testing to show how the agent can make it through progress through those states using an update function and then um, testing how to do it automatically. So to do it automatically, we, re we represent the transitions as a matrix 
they're probabilistic, so <clears throat> any agent might move from one state to um, not any other state, but the states it can move to are a probability distribution. And there's a uniform distribution of time that it's in each state. This is um, roughly similar to how a lot of the SIR models being used for forecasting COVID work, but it's probably a little more um, advanced in that, um, first of all, not all the models have necessarily have these time parameters and not all models um, will allow individual agents to, um, s to sample from a random distribution for the time in these parameters. Um, so uh, because most of <coughs> most of the models in use now don't um, aren't agent based models and so they model the population as one um, kind of pool. So <coughs> we can visualize this this is an auto layout so it's not very good but this is these are the states that that this agent goes through <coughs> and it can take on any one of these when there's two arrows coming out of a node it can take on any one of those paths so here's a test case to show that if we infect them then it counts down until it moves to the next stage and it counts down to the moves to the next stage until it's symptomatic and not contagious um, after 15 days progressing through three stages of the disease okay so we can infect any agent and by calling this update function uh, have them all progress through the disease, but we also want to model the interaction. So to do that, we create a simulation <coughs> here for testing. There are going to be 500 agents, and there are a few parameters that control the makeup of these agents. First, how many other agents do they talk to or interact with every day? And here we have the numbers 10. How many days are you going to simulate for? The numbers 50. Um, what's the contagion probability, meaning if agent one is contagious and interacts with agent two, uh, what's the probability of them passing the disease on? So you can kind of guess if agent one is contagious, uh, contagious 10% of the time and talks to 10 people, on average it's going to pass that <coughs> on to um, one person a day for every day it's contagious. And here the parameters above indicate it might be contagious for a week so that means it's highly contagious because it will be you know it may pass it on to seven other agents before it finally um, it finally uh, gains immunity so <coughs> here we create each agent we start and here's where we start the simulation we start with three infected agents and then simulate it on we to simulate it, we sample pairs and we test if the first one is contagious and the second one isn't, and there's a number, a random number less than this contagion probability, then we infect the second, um, this the second agent, and this just repeats for every agent for every number of times they interact with anyone else, um, and we can keep track of its distribution on every time step and then look at it afterwards. This shows a table of this, which is displayed here. This shows over time the distribution of, across these different states. And you can see that this immunity, um, well, the all of these up here except for red are, are people who have the disease. And this is once they no longer have it or down here are dead. And so it quickly spreads through the population until everybody is immune or as everyone has had it. <clears throat> so typically... Um, the models people use have three bins, or they, they like to talk about three bins. This is, these are the SIR models, so we can take these numbers and fit it into the SIR model curve. And this shows that green infected curve and how it rises and drops over time, it rises quickly and drops over time in this small population with large numbers of contacts and pretty high contagion rate. This actually shows, this code shows how to get the number of new cases per day rather than the total number infected. You know, it's the change um, per day. Um, so that's <coughs> that's sort of like how a lot of um, the differential equation models work because every agent has an equal chance of contacting 
any other agent within the model. But we know that this is not how real social contact works. And real social contact works in m much more clumpy ways um, and can be described by a, a various number, various types of social networks. Here's a function that creates what's um, called a preferential attachment network, which is one way of getting a small world network. Um, and so this is one way you might think that people are connected within a community, that there are some people who know, who are central nodes that know a lot of people and other people only know a few people around them. And these branches might represent families or something like that. Now, this is not necessarily how any society is organized, but it's one way of capturing the fact that this person can be five or six steps away from this person. Um, and ev everyone in the fam, everyone in the community can be relatively close to everyone else in the community um, without having that many connections on each one. So how does this impact the disease spread? Well, you might, because not everyone can contact everyone, if the disease starts over here, it has to spread through here before it can reach the rest. So it might change the timeline of how disease spreads through the network. So <clears throat> we create this network and then have each agent living at a node of the network and it can only contact um, the people who it's attached to. Um, but otherwise, we're going to do exactly the same simulation as before with the same parameters. And here, the only other parameter is this sample from network. So 98% 98 98 of the time, it's going to pick um, an agent will talk to someone within its own network. And then 2% of the time, it might jump and maybe run into someone at the gas station from over here or at the grocery store from over here. So that can be turned off if you want it just to be the network, but, but it sort of overlays a random network that happens 2% of the time onto this network. <coughs> so mostly the simulation is the same, um, other than how we sample who interacts with who. And here's a visualization of that simulation. And you can see, I think there's, it starts with a handful of cases and then they spread mostly to um, neighbors within each branch. And then you can watch like this branch here doesn't get it early. And so, but then um, it eventually reaches them. And this branch here uh, is lucky enough never to have interacted with this person and they never get it. They're only attached to this person, but probably this person is, um, is, too busy interacting with everyone else because they're such a central node that they never actually reach these um, pockets. So you can look at these same graphs now and here we see if you will compare them in a moment but the shape of this curve is different even though this we have the same number of interactions the same um, contagion it's just that the social network is different. Um, so we can also maybe do a better job of representing how behavior might change in response to communication or even just in response to um, the disease state. So, so here's a simulation that explores what happens if we have, so we have these two states that you are infected but you don't know it you have no symptoms and you're infected and you do know it. And what if people stop interacting with others when they, um, once they have symptoms? And this is pretty realistic even before COVID that if you got the flu, you stayed at home and stopped um, going to work or a lot of people did. So here um, we're just going to, um, we're gonna change this rule here for interaction to say that um, people in state three don't interact, and so we're going to look at how the disease is spread only by the people with, only by latent carriers. Um, we could have other branches here and add pro add. What's the probability, or what's the number of people you contact when you have the disease, and we can model those separately. But here, just for a simple um, comparison, uh, once you have symptoms, you no longer interact. So here's what the the progression looks like over time and again we see a rise and a fall and that's again going to be a little different um, 
we can look at all three of these models together. And here's the model where everyone contacts everyone. And here's the model where you only contact within the social network. And you see how this curve has um, gotten a lot longer. And here, where even with, with knowledge and people stop interacting when they have the um, disease, um, you see it slow down a little bit, but, you, but overall uh, it still progresses till almost everyone has it. Okay, so <clears throat> the last thing this base model does is allows to model um, what I'll call policy changes. So in the previous versions, these parameters were fixed over time, but here we're just going to make these input parameters a vector that has a different that could have a different value on any time. So this could help model what happens if we have a quarantine, and so the num interaction parameter is ten, but from day ten. Um, after day 10 it goes to 3 per day and then it goes back up to 10 after day 25 so we have a dip uh, between day 10 and 25 maybe a two week period where we have quarantine to see how that impacts things there's still some interaction but it doesn't get completely cut off um, and then maybe we could explore what if we extended this a week or two weeks other than that, the model is very similar, and this is probably the model to play with if you want to explore anything. Here's the progression of the disease over time, and you can see that there's this first rise, and then this is where the quarantine happens, and it, it actually flattens out. Uh, people, um, new people are not getting it, or it's flattening, which means people, new people are getting it as quickly as um, people are getting cured of it, and so maybe no, very few people are getting it, it drops, but then at day 25, when it comes back on, we see a little rise again. So um, that's an overview of this basic model. And um, three students um, in my class have uh, done projects on versions of these, one looking at demographic networks, one looking at geog geographic networks, and one looking at how um, the model could accommodate vacationers or travelers because most of these models assume a fixed population and what happens when people come in from outside. Um, so look into these. There should be videos uh, describing each of these available as well. Uh, so thank you.